Okay, here we go. We're going to finish up this uh, last part from last week. Um, as we have been looking at this great text, I mean, I hope you see that John is passionate about what he's doing. He's a magnificent pastor. He loves his children that God has given to him. And over and over again, we're going to read some of these things that have been repeated. And he's going to be coming back to them in this last section of the uh, of the uh, text in chapter 5. We'll talk about that when we get to verse 13. Um, but let's go back up to verses 11 and 12. We were talking about uh, God's testimony, that God has testified concerning His Son, verse 9. And we talked about that witness of the Spirit and the water and the blood, the, the reality of Jesus' physical ministry on earth, that, that the God-man began a conception and is, will forever be the God-man. It wasn't some heretical idea where the Christ from heaven came down and just made use of a human being, Jesus, for a while and then went back to heaven. No, no. From the moment of conception, the, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And God is born testimony to that. The Father, the Spirit, has made it clear to us. And uh, <clears throat> the one who believes in the Son, verse 10, of God has the testimony in Himself because He has the Spirit bearing witness. The one who does not believe God has made Him a liar because He has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning His Son. The testimony that was declared from the beginning, right, right, right off the bat, the eyewitness testimony, the gospel that they declared to these dear people from the beginning is God's testimony to His Son. And then in verse 11 now, and 12, and the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and His life, this life, is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So let's go to our, uh, you're back to your hand out there, and just talk about it a little bit. What has God given believers as part of His testimony about His Son? What has He given to us? eternal life. Wow. And that's where that little handout, we'll talk about that, gives some more information about that. We, we've talked about it before. Um, how is this gift related to His Son? Him. Yeah, it's in His Son. That, that's the key. Uh, in His Son. A couple texts. Actually, let me give you, we're talking life in His Son. Life. And uh, John 1, verse 4, Jesus, in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. He is life. He is the life, eternal life. John 5, 26, For just as the Father has life in Himself, even so He gave to the Son also to have life in Himself, so that He can give, only God can give life. And Jesus gives life. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said, remember he's talking with uh, Martha, and he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And then he said, do you believe that? Isn't that great? <laughs> you have eternal life in his son. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. I mean, this, He is life and light. So, we have eternal life in His Son. Okay? That's just got to be understood. But let me ask you this then. What does it mean to have the Son then? What does it mean to have the Son? To have the Son. Okay, it means you have life, but what does it mean to have the Son, personally have the Son? Yeah, and how does that come about, Ray? And, and what, is the, what is our part in having that occur? What do we, what, what is the, the, what do we have 
that without which we can't please God. What do we exercise? Faith, faith, belief. You have to believe. Uh, having the Son has to do with faith. And I think, and we're going to see it in the next lesson too. Uh, you know, John, let's just couple quotes here. John 3.16 the great text, for God so loved the world that uh, this is the manner in which He loved. He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And we've talked about that. John 3.36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But th notice this, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. You see that connection between faith and belief? I'm sorry, uh, b belief and obedience? You see that? They just go together. You can't have faith and trust in Him without obedience to Him. Hasn't John been making that clear? Man, there's some bad teaching out there that says you can have life without that. Okay. So, we've said, you know, about this issue of faith. The critical point here is that your faith is anchored in the Son of God. This person declared from the beginning in the gospel, set forth by the eyewitnesses. You have to go back to the beginning of the gospel of John, John 1, 1 through 18, the declaration of this person and who he is. Um, and we've said also that you can, you can give a, you know, you can know the truth, you can know the facts. And you can even approve of the facts. But will that save you? No, you have to embrace Him by personal faith. And that is a gift from God. The Spirit does take the Word, you understand and know, and He gives life. It's supernatural. It's hard to understand. We, we, it's the new birth, and the Spirit does it. He takes the initiative. But if you don't embrace Him by faith, knowledge and approval will not save you. You're not going to stand before the Lord one day and say, but I approved, I agreed with that truth, and I approved of that truth. I never knew you. Depart from me. Wow. You have to have personal faith in this person. Um, who does not have eternal life? Those without the faith and obedience. And yeah, and what does it say in the text, John? Anyone, he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. So when you start talking about these false teachers who say by the Spirit, this is who Jesus is, and it's the wrong Christ, do they have eternal life? Do they think they do? Yeah. But they're clinging to a Christ who is not the Christ of the Bible. That's the problem. Is that happening today? Are people embracing a Christ that's not the Christ of the Bible? Yeah. Thinking they have eternal life? Sure. Sure. Which is why it's so important to preach and teach the truth and cling to the truth. Um, Christ of the Bible. Colin Cruz said, uh, concludes he, uh, for us, he says, up to this point, the author has emphasized God's witness concerning the person who came in the flesh and work, came by water and blood, person and work of the historical Jesus, the one who was conceived in the womb of Mary, who walked the earth, resurrected, ascended Christ, right hand of God. But here he emphasizes God's testimony concerning the benefit made available to believers through him. Simply put, what is stressed here is God's testimony concerning the eternal life He gives people in His Son. Now, this is so wonderful. In 1 John, eternal life, and I like this, eternal life is not an unending extension of life. It is that. I mean, you're, you can never perish forever. But that's not the point. You know, there's all these... Silly movies, you know, I want to live forever, you know, the bad guy. I want to live forever, and I'm going to drink this, and that, that, you know, Indiana Jones, you ever, remember that? Choose. 
he chews poorly, he drinks, doesn't drink from the cup, and he withers. And that's not it. <laughs> It's not an unending extension of life as we know it. Rather, it is having Jesus Christ Himself. You have the Son. He who has the Son has life. Eternal life is identified with Jesus Christ. He, in fact, is eternal life. The eternal life that was with the Father from the beginning. Isn't that marvelous? If you have Him, you have eternal life because He is eternal life. How could you ever perish? Can't. Okay. Isn't that marvelous? What a great promise. Um, it means that ultimately life here and now is not what it's all about. Right? Whatever you have, whatever you don't have, whatever trials and troubles, whatever it is, that is not the focus. You have to have what Paul said in Colossians. If therefore you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. That's what it's about. How do you think the saints of old were able to be eaten by lions and burned as torches and not give in? Be faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. How many of us are ready to do that? Well, only by the grace of God. Okay. Okay. Put this hand out of the way. Just a few thoughts from this appendix on eternal life. Um, he makes some good points here. Let's just go to the last paragraph. You can read the rest. Uh, we've passed from death to life, but evidences of eternal life. Let's just read that. This giving of life begetting in John, these texts that talk about the new birth mentioned that he mentions above, also reveal what the author of 1 John believed to be evidences of eternal life. I mean, this is purpose of the letter. One, to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he gives you the text. Two, avoidance of sin and doing what is right. The one who practices righteousness is righteous. Overcoming the world. In Christ, you overcome. Your faith is what overcomes the world because you're in the one who overcomes. And if you don't overcome, you don't receive the blessings promised in the kingdom. But it, it's God who does that in, his, in and through you, right? By the power of His Spirit. You're involved, but ultimately He makes sure He undergirds your faith so that you overcome and receive the inheritance. says that in Peter, 1 Peter 1.5. Next, love of fellow believers. The author places, haven't you seen that in the book? Evidence that you have this reality. Uh, love for the brethren. This is uh, heavy emphasis on the fact that eternal life man manifests itself in love for fellow believers. How can you say you love God whom you've not seen if you don't love the brothers who are there with you? Right? Don't tell me you love God if you don't love them. You can tell me that, but there's no reality to what you're saying. This is no surprise, he says again, once we recognize that to have eternal life means to have the Son. That is to have Christ, as you said, Ray, indwelling us. To have Christ indwelling us means that we will love fellow believers because He loves them. <laughs> there is family. Therefore, to say that we have eternal life while we hate fellow believers is a contradiction in terms. To shut our hearts against fellow believers. Remember he talked about that? If you have the world's goods and you just don't, you're not moved to meet needs, in need is evidence that we do not have eternal life. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? And none of us are perfect in that realm, but in general... That love should be a reality in your hearts. Right? Has to be. Okay. Any thoughts before we move on to the next lesson? There's too much hot air suppressing your <laughs> thinking. <laughs> Maybe. I hope not. Okay. Here we go. Lesson 21. You know, we're coming to the end of the book now. And I've given you uh, in the introduction here just a 
uh, again from Colin Cruz, um, kind of his little outline of the end, these last verses from 13 to 20. Uh, we're only going to do three of them today. <laughs> and next week, we're going to dive into probably one of the hardest texts in the New Testament, verse 16. So I'm not even going to mention it. If you don't want to come next week, that's great. But they're going to record it, aren't they? Okay, okay, that's, that's not going to work then. I can't escape <laughs> talking about it. But it's, it's, it'll be good. Come, come. With this section, he says, the last verses, 13 to 21, the author brings, John brings his letter to its conclusion. And like many uh, of the New Testament books in the conclusion, several themes already developed within the letter are mentioned. And he talks about the subsections, and one of them is our text today, verses 13 through 15, which we're going to talk about. The author indicates that his purpose in writing was to reassure his readers concerning their possession of eternal life and explains what that means as far as prayer in general is concerned. And you can read the rest we're going to cover next week, those next B, C, and D. So in this lesson, we want to review this subsection. And we want to see the connection uh, uh, with respect to how prayer in general is vitally related to possessing eternal life. And uh, why would you, again, what is eternal life? It's Christ. So the, the, the bottom line is eternal life is an eternal love relationship with God. Isn't that true? Um, you remember John 17, 3? This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life is this beautiful, intimate love relationship that's ever existed, especially seen between the Father and the Son from all eternity. And that, that now He brings you into that love relationship forever. John 17, 25 and 26, Jesus says in His prayer, O righteous Father, all of the world has not known You. The world has not known You. Depart from Me. I never knew You. No matter how religious You are. Yet I have known You, and these have known that You sent Me, and I have made Your name. We're going to talk about the name known to them and will make it known. And here's the purpose. So that the love with which you love me may be in them. The Father is sharing His very love for His Son with you. Isn't that marvelous? And then He says, and I in them. The implication is, I'm sharing my love for you, Father, with them. Forever. So eternal life begins now in this love relationship. Um, so, what is prayer in this relationship? Talking to the one you love. Communion with the one you love. That's why the command to pray without ceasing is not law. It's the natural manifestation of a heart of one who loves God. How can you not pray? It's like running around day after day, not even interacting with your wife, you know. The one you love. Don't you like to talk with your wife or your spouse? or Don't you? Man, I, I don't even like... You're going to the store, honey, I'm coming too. Sometimes she has to say, no. I need to get away from you. I need some time on my own. Okay, honey, I, okay, I get you. But I love being with her. Don't you love being with the Lord, talking to Him all day long in the midst of the battle? Help, Lord, help. Anyway, it's communion with the one you love, like you said, Sherry. That's so significant. In the midst of good, too. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Yeah, all the things that are coming as you run the race, pray, pray, commune. And uh, so, it's, it's so significant. It's about your love relationship with Him. I hope prayer is not a duty for you. Man, i got to get up and spend 30 minutes in prayer because that's what the saints did in the past. You know, Those great saints. Three hours in prayer. I'm going to get up at four and spend three hours in prayer. Wait a minute. 
<laughs> it can't be law. It's got to be love, right? Um, I hope that's true for you. Huh? I said I like the love, not law. Yeah, amen. Amen. If it's law, you're in big trouble. Because you don't know him if it's just law. Okay, so 513. How are we doing? We're doing okay. These things. Here we go. End of the book. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So that you may know that you have eternal life. Wow. So, let's just ask a couple questions. What does these things refer to in this verse? What do you think? These things I have written to you. Is he referring to everything he just read, wrote before he said that? Or? Okay, what do you think? I think that's fair. <laughs> what do you, anybody else? Thoughts? I think you have doctrine like that. Jesus is a son of God, mm -hmm. humanity, and deity. Mm -hmm. You have love of the brethren in there. Yeah. You have several of yeah. the things he's talked about. Yeah, yeah. So, would you agree that these things were, are, are the whole letter? You bet. It's a short letter, relatively speaking. But John's saying these things. <laughs> okay. So, I wrote on my little answer, which is the approved answer, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All written in his letter from beginning up to this point. Everything he's written so far. Okay. Um, <clears throat> who has John written these things? Say again. Can I just make a comment? Sure. I mean, you probably didn't find it. But, um, so I look back to the beginning to see if he used similar language, these yeah. things. And he does in verse 4. Good, good. Says, these things we write so that our joy Very good. Complete. Very good. Yeah, that's a good observation. Very good. Just right in your margin there, um, John. I, I appreciate that. First John one four. First John one four. That's very good. Thank you, brother. That's excellent Bible study methods. Good job. Very good. Excellent. Perfect. It does bookend it, doesn't it? The whole the whole letter. Thank you. So who has John written these things to? Who's the who is he written to? Okay, what's it say in the text? I have written to you who believe, right? Um, in what? You who believe in the name of the Son of God. Okay, very good. Don't be embarrassed, that's cool. I, if, if I said two plus two equals, everybody goes, he's trying to trick me. I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> it, it's just, just go to the text, you see what he's saying, and then we can talk about it. Okay, what's that say? Yeah, I'm writing these things. That's another confirmation, my little children. And, and who's, the ob who's he writing to there, Francis? My little children. Yes, yes, I believe that's fair. That's very good. Excellent, excellent. Okay, you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, he's talking about his little children. There's, there's always the others who say they do, but don't. Because this is why they're not included. What does it mean to believe in the name of the Son of God? What does it mean? To obey him. Huh? To obey him. Okay, that's part of it. But what's the idea of, uh, Lisa, what's the idea of name? In If you believe in the name, what's that tell? What is it? What is... What does he mean when he uses that idea, believe in the name? Faith and trust. Okay, faith and trust, belief. But what's the idea of name communicate? Who he is. In the fullness of his person and work, name has to do with 
the fullness of his person and work, and I would say from all of Scripture. Now, you may not understand that initially as you come to faith. You may have the fundamental ideas of the gospel that he's the lamb, and I need the lamb to be my propitiation. But you don't stop there. Okay? You don't stop with some fundamental ideas about who Jesus Christ is. You keep going. And uh, if you want to, I wrote this down. I've g given you this before. But let me just read. This is Paul's perspective on the gospel. Okay? Romans 1, 1 through 5. Just listen to this, because the name is in here. Paul, a bonds. What's Romans? Romans is the gospel. You know, oh my gosh, rich, deep. You can study forever in the book of Romans and still be learning truth about the gospel. Anyway, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Now, where does it, where, where does it come from? Huh? God. Yeah, but listen to what he says. Wait, that's okay. It does come from God. Which he promised God which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The whole Old Testament has to do with the Gospel. And here's, here's the focus, the content of the Gospel. The next verse 3. Con the Gospel promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Spirit Scriptures concerning his Son. It's about a person. About a person. A person is the gospel. Now, we sum it up with truths like tulip or doctrines of grace. That, that's not the gospel. Jesus Christ is the gospel. Okay? And the whole Old Testament testifies and points to Him. Didn't He say that? And here Paul kind of gets into it. Concerning His Son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. How important is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant to the gospel? Critical. That's who he is. The son of David, the king of Israel and the nations for all eternity. That's who Jesus is. That's what the Old Testament says. More to it. Who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. According to the Spirit of Holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, the confirmation of who He is declared by the resurrection, that's why we know we're justified, because God puts His stamp of approval on that work of this person. Being raised to sit at His right hand, that's the position of the Davidic King, to dispense blessings. Oh, it's just marvelous. And then he says in verse 5, Paul says, about this person and work, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for His name's sake. The gospel has to do with a declaration of His person and work, and part of that work is to change His people from the inside out, to bring about love, relationship, and obedience, He says. The obedience of faith. And what's the reason for bringing it about? For His name's sake. His people, his name is on the line with your deliverance and transformation. And that's why the book of Romans, is, you know, this great text about what it means to have sanctification, to know and love God and walk with God. Romans 6, 7, and 8. Anyway, you get the point? The gospel is a magnificent declaration of the person and work of Christ from all of Scripture. And you're going to spend the rest of your life growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you better be growing. Don't rest content. Oh, I know Tulip. I know the doctrines of grace. Do you know the person and the fullness of the declaration of who He is from Genesis to Revelation? That's our goal. We want you to understand that. And you won't get there even in eternity. <laughs> Guess what? When you've been there a billion moments, you will still be wanting more understanding and love for that person that you're beholding without sin and trying to get your arms around this mystery of Jesus Christ.
Won't that be great? I think it's going to be marvelous. Okay, sorry, I'm preaching. Who's doing this today? Keep going. You are. Sean? <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm doing that. Okay, let's keep moving. What was the purpose of his writing the letter? So that what? Okay, you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, I hadn't noticed. Is the is no at the beginning? Is the verb at the beginning? Okay. Very good. Yeah. And uh, we'll see that that what that little word no means. It's a really cool little term. Um, <clears throat> why did such a letter have to be written? to the church of John's day, and why is it still directly relevant for the church today? Because the secessionists were saying that they had special knowledge. Okay. About who? Uh, only revealed knowledge about who Christ was. Yeah. And, and what it means to have a relationship with God. False teaching. False teaching. Right? False teaching. Is that happening today? You better believe it. So, um, that's good, Sean. Foundational to eternal life is belief in the proper object of faith, isn't it? And in the context of 1 John, it goes back to the Jesus declared from the beginning by the eyewitnesses, the gospel, the gospel of John. Again, John 1, 1 through 18. Who is this person? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him to us. It's that object of faith that you had better have your faith anchored in. Not anything less. Okay? And such genuine faith given by God's grace in the proper object of faith brings supernatural new covenant change in the lives of His people because of the indwelling presence of the Spirit. I've come to appreciate the ministry of the Spirit so much more by reading 1 John. It's marvelous how John views the ministry of the Spirit, who testifies to the glories of Jesus Christ in us, keeps us, right? Colin Cruz has a good paragraph there. I put that in there. He says, um, the author's purpose in writing is that they may you may know that you have eternal life, his readers had been disturbed. False teachers have a way of really messing things up. We've had it happen here. It happens in other churches. You, you, it doesn't take much either. Just a little bit of arsenic in the glass kills you. But these guys, man. So, they were disturbing the saints. His readers had been disturbed by the denials and claims, page 2, of the secessionists or the false teachers. These people denied important elements of the message the readers had embraced from the beginning. So the, the message about Jesus' person and work, they're, they're, they're picking away at it and they're undermining it and they're, they're tearing it apart. Because that's what the enemy does, right? That's what Satan does. That's the Antichrist all throughout history. And, and uh, here's, the, here's the real irony. They also claim to be recipients of special revelation through the Spirit to which the readers were not privy. You better watch out if somebody comes along and says, I've got a handle on this and I want to fill you in. Where'd you get that? You know, which is why you guys need to be good Bereans because everybody's fallible except this book, Right? This is where the authority rests. Not me, not anybody who... I mean, we're doing our best. But you are responsible to not just sit there and go, Oh, yeah, what's his name said it? Greg said it. It's got to be true. Are you kidding? Who am I? <laughs> I'm a vessel of clay, man. And I think I'm more of a chamber pot, personally. <laughs> in, as a vessel. That's how I feel about it sometimes. We're nothing. This Word, Christ, is everything. Okay, so they had this special revelation. 
The reader's assurance had been shaken by these denials and claims, and the author's primary reason for writing the letter was to bolster their assurance by counteracting the false teaching of these false prophets. This is, the author sought to do this by pointing out that it was his readers, his little children, who had truly received eternal life, who truly knew God, not the false teachers. It was his readers who manifested the authentic marks of those who have eternal life. And here they are. They were the ones who continued in the teaching first proclaimed by the eyewitnesses because the Spirit kept them from falling into apostasy. They were the ones who continued to obey the commands of the Lord. And they were the ones who loved the children of God, right? Which is the essential mark of those who have eternal life. So, to know you have eternal life, clinging to the truth. So let me ask you, do you see these things in your life, the fruit of the Spirit of God? Do you know? Do you know you have eternal life? And I think, let's just think about it a little bit. To, to know this, it's the, it's the Greek word oida, like to know something is a reality, a fact, truth. Um, it's not gnosko, which can be, you know, is more, can be very relational. But this is to know, objectively know, I think. And uh, how, what is part of that knowledge? You know what he's, we, we know what he just said, right? You know this is true for the person who has eternal life. What else is part of knowing for you? Is it just, huh? His will. Okay, you, it, let's say you know, you know what he just said, but what else is part of your having a confidence that you know that you have eternal life? Is it just about knowing what it means to have eternal life? What about in your life personally? Isn't there an experiential aspect to this? Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, do I see this? Not just, I just don't know it, but I'm seeing this reality in my life because of the presence of the Spirit. That I, that I love the people of God. That I, I love Jesus. I want to obey Jesus. That I... Um, uh, Cling to the truth of the gospel and the beauty of Christ and all that's been... Isn't there an experiential? If you just have a cold knowledge about these things without the experiential aspect seen in your life, I don't think you can know. You can't say you know you have eternal life just by knowing the facts. Right? Okay. I think that's fair. So do you see these things in your life personally? Things that only the Spirit of God can do. Not perfectly, but a reality. Okay. Let's go to the next one. This is the confidence which we have before Him. Verse 14. Greg? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to deflect it too much, but this is just such an amazing component of Christianity. Mm -hmm. I would talk to the Saudis about this, and they would say, well, how could you... You can't know that you have favor with God. That's something that you find out wow. when you die. And, and if you knew it now, how would God keep you on the hook to continue to obey? Wow! They said that? Yeah, I mean, not as many <coughs> words, but... How many years did you live in Saudi Arabia, Robin? Uh, six. Six years. Robin was living in that culture for six years, so he's... Keep going. But just, I mean, we don't obey because God keeps us on the hook. We obey because we love Oh, him. amen, brother. You know, <laughs> Such a wow. Distinct and the peace that it gives you is just amazing. Amen. And and uh, isn't that how our hope is increased? Remember Romans five, and, and we rejoice in our tribulation, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance shows proven character. And when you see that, you have more hope that you're heading in the right direction. And it's all the work of God. That was great. Keeps you on the hook. Wow. <laughs> that's staggering. That's the lie of the enemy, isn't it? That's the Antichrist right there. False teaching. Very good. Thanks, brother. So, 
Verse 14, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So knowing that you have eternal life because you truly do have eternal life is directly related to your prayer life. What does having assurance of your eternal love relationship with God give you as you come into His presence to pray? What does it give you? Confidence. confidence. Lisa goes, confidence. Shout it. <laughs> Shout it, dear lady. <laughs> confidence. Confidence in the Greek, parousia, means a state of boldness and confidence. Courage, confidence, fearlessness, especially in the presence of persons of high rank and you can't get any higher ranking than god <laughs> can you oh my goodness here's a couple texts i put them down there for you hebrews 4 14 through 16 therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness weaknesses but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near, same word, with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Isn't that great? And as you come to him, remember it's still a throne. He's the king and we're petitioning him. But there's a promise there. John 16 23 and 24. In that day, you will not question me about anything. True, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, you will receive that your joy may be made full. It's just unbelievable. Ephesians 3, 11 and 12. This is in accordance with the eternal purpose which He carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access to God through faith in Him. Man, people, we this is magnificent that you can come with that kind of confidence, right? Because of Christ. You could never get close without Him, right? But you're covered by His blood. You're righteous. You're clothed in His righteousness, right? You're loved in the Beloved and accepted in the Beloved. So you can come with confidence. And what can you be confident of? What does He say? If what? Okay. Read the rest of it, though. If we ask what? Anything according to His will, we're going to come back to that. He hears us. Okay. Um, goes back to John 14. Jesus said to His disciples, Whatever you ask in My name, that I will do. We'll talk about this. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask Me anything in My name, I will do it. We're getting back to this idea of according to His will. Okay. So what is the great qualifying phrase you guys gave, just gave it that is associated with God hearing your prayers? What's the great qualifying phrase? According to His will. I want a Cadillac tomorrow! Yay! No. <laughs> I don't think so. We're going to talk about it. Okay, here's a, here, go look. Somebody look up First John three twenty two. What also did John link assurance of answered prayer to in First John three twenty two? Yes, obedience. Do you see how that works together? Love relationship, communion with God, is directly associated with obeying Him. So if you're one, the one obeying Him out of love for Him, you can have confidence your prayers are going to be heard. I love it. Whatever we, whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Wow. Wow. Okay. Remember John 14, 15? Jesus said, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. Boy, this is what, it is love, not law. It has to be. It has to be. That's what Christianity is about. Love. 1 John 5.15. We're getting done. If we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked of Him. Here John, de John defines what it means for God to hear us. So, what does John say? If He hears us, what will happen? 
If, if we know He hears us, what's gonna, what do we, else do we know? That we have the request which you have asked from Him. Because we know He hears us. But what's the qualifying phrase? According to His will. Okay, so I want to challenge you as we wrap up. I have a section here called Asking According to God's Will. I want you to really think about this. Because what do we pray for? And what can we know that God will answer for sure? According to His will. So let's think of some things here. And I've given you some text, but you have to go back and get the context of these things. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Is that His will? Which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world. Is that His will? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove, confirm what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And if you go to Romans 12 and 3 and following, you'll see all kinds of beautiful commands that are His will for you to pray. If you pray according to His will, what's going to happen? He's given it to you. Man! Ephesians 5.17. So you can go back and read the context. But I'm just saying it's good for you to pray these things because you know God is going to answer those prayers. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Go uh, The whole three chapters of Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 are the idea of what, how you should be, what you should do. Can you pray that with confidence? God, I want this in my life. Please. Will He answer? His, he already has. You know you've received it. This is a mindset. Here we go. Look at, look at this one. 1 Thess 4.3 For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's a biggie. Your conformity into the image of Jesus Christ is His will for you. Are you praying for that? And all that that involves? And He gives you, the first, he gives you an, a little bit here, a context, that you abstain from sexual immorality. That's part of it. But go back and look at the context. There's more. Purity. Holiness. Wow. Are you praying that for yourself and for the people in this body? It's not just about... It's not wrong to ask for things that we need. You know, sickness and finances and all those things. But this is the will of God for you. Pray this with confidence, these things. And watch God do it in your life. First Thess 5.18 In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Are you a thankful person? I've got to confess so many times. I, now I'm judging my thankfulness by how quickly I leave the complaint section to the thankful section. <laughs> oh, that initial response. Oh, what sin. Forgive me, Lord God. Thank you for this trial that just came out of the blue. And I wish it hadn't happened, but it did. Thank you. I don't do that immediately, usually. But man, I, the Spirit's right there. What are you doing? What are you doing? Who's in control of these things? Oh, man. I want more of that immediately. How about 1 Peter 2.15? For such is the will of God that by doing right, by being righteous, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men who hate the truth, who hate righteousness. You're a witness. You're a testimony. See the context. 1 Peter 2.13-20. All the things that he talks about, what it means to do right. Pray those things for yourself. Right? First Peter 4, 2. Live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And you can see that in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 5. Or maybe, yeah, maybe I got that wrong. I'm not sure. But go back and look at the context of 4, 2. Okay? Colossians 1, 9. For this reason, 
Since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray, Paul says, for you, and to ask that you may, this is what he's praying, that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And go back and look at Colossians 1, 9 through 12 and see what he's talking about, right? To do the will of God, you should know the will of God. Paul's praying that they would know that and do it for the glory of God. So just finishing up with, so please make that an exercise for yourself. Go back and look those texts up in their context and know that uh, the, the promise we just read, we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, for we know that we have the request which he, we have asked from him if it's in accordance with his will. And we're, there's a wealth of things to pray that are his will for you. Jesus is our example. John 4, 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. It's what sustained him and drove him to do the will of God out of love for his Father. John 6, 38, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's the way that God has always worked. The Son sweetly submitting to the Father. And he's our example of submitting to the will of God, not, our, not doing what we want, but what he wants. Look at this, Matthew 12, 50. For whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. You have relationship with Him in the family of God. Wow. Consequences of not doing His will. Here we go. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he, only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. That's pretty frightening. And the context of that is the Sermon on the Mount. The whole Sermon on the Mount has to do with your attitudes, your thinking, your behavior, everything. Right? Not to be a hypocrite that Jesus points out. Page 4. But look at this. Here's the consequences of doing His will. The world is passing away and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God, what? lives forever eternal life. Isn't that great? <laughs> Are you doing the will of God? Are you praying for that in your life with confidence that God will bring this about because it's His will for you? It's according to His will. Go home and let, let's just keep doing that for each other. Man, I need it. We need to pray for each other. Here's the benediction. I love this. And then we're done. Run to your pew. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, here we go, equip you in every good thing to do His will. Working in us that which is... He is working in us that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever and all God's people say... Amen. Let's pray.